Hey, everybody, welcome into the latest edition of the Sports Fanatic News YouTube football sports cast, where we're talking about our Philadelphia Eagles, and this one did some recaps of games yesterday, if you want to check them out on my channel. of Yesterday's games, we'll be doing that again today, but here we're here to talk about the Philadelphia Eagles, the Fly Eagles Fly of Philadelphia. As first and foremost, I'm here to check on, on my co-host, Andrew, who was last on, I think it was two weeks ago, right, the last time uh, we were able to link up. Yeah, it was pretty recent. It might have been a little bit before that, but it it's, hasn't been as, as long as it has been in the past, that's for sure. But I just got uh, just got back from Arkansas uh, this morning. so. Arkansas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's an inside joke, so people probably, certain people probably don't understand what the heck we... Yes, just we, like, we just know it's like pronounced other, Arkansas. But <laughs> yeah, just like certain people have inside jokes amongst uh, their own staff. Yeah, what we do too. Um, but, but the... Anyway, going on into the Eagles, um, I think similar to what I'm and with other videos when I talked to the Sixers about with you and what forth, I'll just send it over to you for just so we get uh, it thrown out there just to get a couple things out there. What's your first two things or three things that really came to mind after this season was over about the Philadelphia Eagles, whether now that it's a week removed, that's why I think it's cool doing the podcast now too, if it's mixed with positive and negative, or if it's all just negative, or if it's more positive, whatever. What are the three things that you kind of took away from the season, from the way you felt going in to how it actually ended up at the end? Um, first and foremost, I think we came in with a lot of questions um, from Hertz, from um, Sirianni and everything, but I think we got a lot of those answered. In, in all honesty, I think you ride with Hertz, and I think you ride with Sirianni another year. And I think that's where it's going to continue to go down the right path. I think instead of being concerned about your coaching staff like we were coming into the season, I think we can actually be solidified and like where we are with that. So I think that's the most important thing is you found out you have a coach, and I think you found out you have a quarterback going into next year as well, so you don't have to worry about that in the draft or free agency. You can turn to all your other positions. So I think that's a positive. I think secondly, I think we still realize where our flaws were on defense. Um continue to overlook that linebacker position for whatever reason. And I think that's an area I want to see on the defense improve the most is, is linebacker. I think I get it. TJ Edwards and Alex Singletary, they're, they're fun stories. And I think single. Well, Singleton when I looked actually, it up, Andrew, the last time they drafted a linebacker in the first round, I think was before we were born. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, yeah. Like, like, like they didn't even do it since 96. So it continues to be overlooked for whatever reason, even though it's been a major need for, I don't know how many years now. But I think that, I mean, again, the Singleton story and, and the, the Edwards, they're fun guys to watch, but I don't think they're number one linebackers. So if you can mix them with the true linebacker or something like that, it would go a long way for them and the team. So I think that's two. Three. The third uh, takeaway from the season is um, I think the rebuild or the retool, whatever you want to call it, is going to be a lot faster than we expected. I mean, I think we thought – a lot of people thought we'd miss the playoffs this year, and then you go into next year and continue that rebuild. But listen, we made the playoffs this year. I think we're going to be right there fighting as long as you play the off season, right? Let me put that first and foremost. If you play the off season, right, you'll be right there fighting for the division crown next year. Yeah, yeah. There's certain holes, like obviously, like you said, linebackers one throwing out the receivers behind Devonte uh, would be would be another. Um, but the, but those are all things with three picks and with money to spend in free agency, like you were hinting at you could do now it's just about execution and hitting on the things um that you do do but 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 i agree um of you when it comes to the coaches obviously gannon with the way that's starting to lean it seems like he might end up getting a coaching job with the interviews he's getting but um if that happens then there's other guys that got fired that are defensive minded and in a future podcast will probably end up talking about uh one of them because they're probably end up getting hired as a defensive coordinator but um, for now, he's still the defensive coordinator. He adjusted over time. I would have to envision over time the next adjustment he will make is probably glitching more. But uh, obviously, that wasn't his style yet. He mixed it in a little bit more as the year went on. But like the defense played fine overall. I think the be the way to make the defense better through its falls would be to mix in, especially since you still have Fletcher. You had the Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham of the world. Sweat was not healthy for the playoff game, but was healthy for a lot of the time. You had guys that could blitz and do it. You just picked, like, 
two to three percent of each game to do it. Other than that, I'm fine with. I thought Jonathan Gannon did improve throughout the season. The one thing I would knock him on oh, is you have, you have to mix in the blitzing more at the NFL level. You can't you can't play it like it's a college quarterback. You can just drop back on and hope he throws himself into. Unless if you're playing Jimmy Garoppolo, I guess. Uh, but or Kirk Cousins at times. But if you're not playing people that certain at times throw themselves into mistakes, Baker Mayfield could be thrown in there also. Then you then you're not going to necessarily win the games that particular way. You're going to need to actually blitz it a little bit. Which when we did mix in, that's why I'm surprised. That's the one, only thing I would get on a bit for because when we did mix in at the end of the season, that's when we made some of our really good kind of those pizzazz or those diamond in the rough plays throughout the game defensively that seemed like momentum grabbers, but then we still didn't blitz that much. So it was like a double, <clears throat> it was like a weird like thing where like you're almost seeing it in front of your face, like, oh, that worked. And then just deciding to still play the same defense we did all season where I'm like, well, we could adjust in game, but again, it's his first season. He started adjusting in game better throughout the year, just not with blitzing. But that might just be I something think, he's still trying to feel out I in general. I think his in-game adjustment was actually good. It was his pre-game stuff that was bad. He got out class as you went into the games, but over time, I think that's why you saw the slow starts. He get out class, and then we pick it up in the second to through fourth quarter, holding teams. And I think that's his in-game adjustment was actually really good. So I'm actually disagree with him on that point because. Um, I mean, you look at the even the Buccaneers game. You give up three scores right away, and then you adjust, and you hold them five straight scoreless, five straight possessions, scoreless. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, we held <clears throat> like we again. Like if I picked why we did that, we played very good, which which is which is credible to Jonathan Gannon. But if you're not playing how you did in the second half with the pass coverage, you're not starting to get everything tight and you're still playing to the level of how it was in the first half, and you're letting guys just run open, the one way to counteract your defense, letting people get open, is trying to be more aggressive. So then it kind of builds the momentum back up. That's the only thing that would worry me with Gannon, not the fact that it's like, it's like Stephen A kind of says sometimes on first take, like when you're kind of coming at somebody for one thing, you're not insulting them as a whole. You think they're actually good at their job. It's just if there's one thing I had to pick out, that they have to fix. It's it's like how we always talked about Andy Reid was a good coach while here, but his clock management sucked. That was the one thing he had to fix. With Jonathan Gannon, he's done fine. He's done the in-game adjustments. The one thing he hasn't always adjusted with is realizing a blitz has worked and then sticking with it. That, that, that's, the, that's the only part I was getting at, where it's great to have the other attributes and actually probably it's first and foremost be able to get your D-backs to run block or not run block but run protect and be able to get them to pass protect very well because that's harder to do than to get people to blitz so like that's an easier thing to implement at the end of when systems in so uh, but that's why i'm not going to get on big about it but if if he's still here going forward i would envision we're going to be a more not not to an oomph degree but be a more blitz mixed in system uh next year and that would be the next set of adjustments that uh, Jonathan Gannon would be making. Plus, the Eagles are also rumored to pick an edge, one of the edge rushers, that are one of the primary edge rushers with one of the three picks. So, uh, if they end up doing that, then I think that would even lead to blitzing even more. Because if you pick one of the best rushers in the game and you don't blitz that much, well, then what the hell did you even spend your pick on for that? You know what I mean? That's true. So that's why I feel like they probably would mix it in a little bit more next year. But we, you talked about um, – that's kind of my first two um, cents on the overall team. When it comes to the offense, though, you talked about Jalen Hurts, which I think anybody that talks to me about Jalen Hurts knows where I stand with him. I think he definitely should deserve a opportunity for next year, and that's also compounded by the fact of there's a few people I like in this year's draft, but there's nobody at quarterback that you're like, oh, my God, this dude is – like the one and thing – yeah. Coming into this season, I wanted to stick with Jalen Hurts for most reasons anyway, just because I thought, like, the way they handed it to him, 
this was going to be a year like you were saying. We didn't have the highest expectations, and then they became higher expectations as the season went on, and then we actually made the playoffs. So that, with that being said, obviously at that point, I'm definitely going to want to keep them. But even early in the season when it wasn't the best, I was one of the people that were still saying you see glimpses of like the the perseverance, the resilient leader mentality in Jalen Hurts, where like you were talking about with the second half, he could do absolutely nothing for an entire first half. And then all of a sudden in the second half, he comes out and finds a way, a will and a way to run himself down the field, get guys open by being able to use his legs. So then it makes the RPOs more effective. Um, he, he found ways to do that multiple times throughout the season. So he's a dual threat for sure. He's just still developing, honing in more on the on certain route throwing. That, that, that's all it is. And certain, not just route throwing for certain routes, but certain route pickups for other play designs where like sometimes would be too focused on read one and not notice somebody else is up for like the wide open. That would be like the third read on the play that so like Jalen hurts has things he has to develop, but most young quarterbacks do that are not to the degree of Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes. So like most guys have to have to really uh, show stuff um uh, and develop a lot of stuff. And even Lamar had to do that. And Mahomes did it. He sat behind somebody to start. So, like, even those guys that are ridiculous did it. So, it's just going to take a little bit of time for him to be the GOAT or very good. But, like, he, he definitely started off good and showed he can find different ways to win a game. And that's uh, that's definitely what you want in a quarterback to be able to not just win one way, but if all else is failing, be able to find a way to win another way. So. Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. I just think. I think that's the most important thing is they're going to have to learn to get off those fast starts. So we don't have to keep worrying about that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, a fast start also, a fast start also is as um, important and potent. Like you, 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 you hit it earlier when you mentioned it, but on your offense, it's just on your deep, like add in the Justin, the second episode of Sirianni, but like, obviously if you could get off to a quick, 14 nothing lead that's going to help your defense out just by a domino effect most of the time because you have all the momentum in your favor you've been on the field a good bit so the defense is right like normally that's all going to help that out when the first half the eagles tend to have their quicker drives and then put the defense back on them. so all that all that leads to um having negative effects obviously in the first half so i i do agree when it comes to that that i would say first half adjustments um, which is basically what we've been talking about in the first 12 minutes a bit, too, is a big thing the Eagles need to focus on in this offseason, how to come into next year. Obviously, you're not going to focus on that now. That would be once you add all the guys for next season in the free agency and what have you, so you know what your roster is. But you would then have to focus on, like, what are we going to do to get off to more blazing starts and not have to be one of the more rally-it-back um, teams in the league, so to speak. No, exactly. Yeah, I agree with that completely. But when it comes to other than just Jalen Hurts, um, since we got well, Jalen Hurts and obviously we have Devontae Smith, both of those guys worked out really well. Um, from the offense going forward, Goddard's also mixed in there, someone who probably just automatically going to keep. What, of the running backs, because this is the interesting question, with the way the Eagles went, what do you think they're going to do there going forward? Because there's already people rumoring with the way this, and it's not necessarily, I think, because of his skill. It's more the way the franchise has always, whenever he got injured, it seemed to just go to somebody else when it comes to Miles Sanders, that he might end up being traded. So like, what, what do you think the, the, the Eagles are, are going to actually end up doing with running back? Because obviously they figured it out with whoever they had to put back there for most of the part. This season, they even revived Jordan Howard's career, for God's sake. So, like, what well, what do you think they're going to do? Is this, like, a team that necessarily needs a go back there? Or do they just have, are they one of those teams that, like, have a very good running system that if you have the Kenneth Gamewell back there, that's why Boston Scott, that's why Clement in the Super Bowl even a couple of years, like, was very successful. And then Nick Sirianni implemented just a new, uh, even better running system than the one Doug had running-wise, probably. So, like, do you think it's more 
the backs we have, and we have to really focus on keeping the same guys around, or it's more just the system is very effective for running. Uh, it's a mix of things, but I think the running back position as a whole is kind of overhyped or, or overrated in, in a sense of trying to get that best back in the league. Like, if you look at the best backs, I mean, how far do they take you? I mean, you look at Derrick Henry, he's been out of the playoffs first round. You look at Ezekiel Elliott, he isn't, I mean, the Cowboys haven't done anything. You look at Saquon Barkley, Giants don't do anything. So I think it's more the system and the offensive line you have in place. I mean, you look at, uh, the the better teams, you got to look at quarterback first and everything. And uh, I think you have, have the right backs. I really don't think you have to look look at running back this offseason. Um, I'd run a back with the same guys, same group you have, because, again, it's an it's a position that, yeah, I mean, obviously it's always nice to have the best back in the league. But in terms of running back, I mean, name me a team, name me the last team that won because of the running back. Do you mean the entire um, Super Bowl or like the? The um, just in general. Yeah, like, like, no, they named me a team that like did well. I mean, even making the Super Bowl. I mean, at this point. Yeah, making it. I it it's constant. Because the 49ers are more their. Some people would probably say if they make it, the 49ers, but then you could argue the 49ers also have a very effective running offense. That would be well, a that, that, reason why they were able to get to the, the Super Bowl, too, with Debo and Elijah Mitchell. So. That's my point. They don't have a top tier running back. They have a, a good group of guys and a solid offensive line mixed with defense. It's not a Derrick Henry. It's not a Zeke. It's not those. Uh, I mean, even Dalvin Cook. I mean, what have the Vikings done outside the uh, NFC Championship game a few years ago? But I mean, they again they got knocked out because they didn't have a quarterback in the end. Um, and and we all know how that game ended, obviously. But the game that the, the play that changed that was the the pick six. So I think if I'm the Eagles, I I just run it back with the same group. I don't know about you. Well, the reason I was more asking is the Sanders effect because people always qu- like talk about the rumors around Sanders since he's been banged up. They tend to always like this year before, even when he came back before Howard went down, since he was hot, even though Sanders we saw was like a 4.5 whatever since he's coming to the league, a yardage per carry guy when he's been able to get the rock officially. They never tend to go back to him where it's not like, most teams, if you have a guy that you're confident in that's your talented back for the future, if he's coming back, even if someone's hot, you're going to automatically start mixing him back into the offense as soon as he's ready to go because he, he's that dude and he's the dude you want to have as the, as the primary uh, in the future. Where me personally, I really like Miles Sanders. Do the Eagles really like Miles Sanders? That's the question I have. That, 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 that's more why I ask that question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they like him as a feature back. Uh, again, there's a reason why he wasn't the goal line and he finished the year with that touchdown. It's because they, um, they rely on the other guys for that, that spot. And I think. Well, the, yeah, like you're going to put Jordan Howard in a Boston Scots even because he's a little the, the, guy. The, the, you don't expect him to have the strength he has. And then he comes in and. Uh, still gets a touchdown at the goal line, so to speak. The Packers won 13 games doing that with um, Aaron AJ. Jones kind of being the feature back and then A.J. Dillon going the goal line. You saw that. I mean, I know they lost, but the playoff game yesterday that he got their one touchdown was their Jordan version of Jordan Howard. Yeah. So no, I, I think it's a plus to have that. The, um, the Arizona also did that to start the season before James Kiner took over as the feature back. Yeah, or not a feature back as the primary back. I mean, he was used as well, the... Well, because the uh, back went down for a while, so... Yeah, Edmonds. Was, yeah, it forced them to do that. And then I think Edmonds went back, and then I think Connor went down. Yeah, and then the... Yeah, it was like kind of similar, like, where we kind of had to, at a certain point, start playing Sanders more because then Howard was banged up. But, like, it's weird how the Eagles have managed Miles Sanders since he's come in, coming back from injuries. That's that, that that's to say the least. That's, that, that's more where I'm going at with that. That's why I wouldn't be shocked. Because of what you said about the running system, too, if they use him as trade bait, because like you said, if you have a good running system, the Patriots are even, they've always had random Joe Schmo running backs, and they're still mixing into their offensive scheme. They're not a running football team by any stretch, but they're mixing in to throw your defense off. And they've always just had the Rex Burkheads, the James Whites, the Deion Lewises of the world for the most. So, like, if you have a good running system, and nobody thought Aaron Jones when he got drafted, I think he was like a two draft, draft, but like, like, so, like, th- nobody thought those dudes were going to be the dudes 
So, like, if you have a good system, you can just bring him in. I don't think anybody thought Kenneth Gainwell was going to be a Darren Sproles white, white, like, not just white, but, like, double white because it's his rookie season. He's still developing, but, like, something that looks like he could develop and by his third season be a very productive guy in your offense. Only people thought that coming in. So that shows how you're – you're just able to work it with the running backs. And then when, when it comes to that position, you just have a good system, not necessarily just for running, but for doing the quick little plays as well to get them the ball and all that as, as well. So that's why I wouldn't be shocked if we trade Miles Sanders because of what you said too about the running back position being a little overrated. You could probably get more assets for him and then you could just stick with Jordan Howard, Kenneth Gainwell, if you're the Eagles and Boston Scott and maybe draft a like how they've been drafting guys in the middle rounds at running backs in the last few years, and then there's some guys have moved on, obviously. Um, but like you could do that again and uh, see what happens. You also have the um, what's its name, the guy that they signed Huntley, right? The guy that they signed at the end of the season when he played the last game, and then they signed him to yes. the active roster. Yeah, so you also have him, who's more of a like returner slash catching back. It seems like, but but. but you're seeing maybe if he can develop into something. So they have talent at that position. That's why it'll be interesting to see what they do with Miles Sanders. But when it comes to the overall Eagles, though, we talked a lot about the offense in this one. Before we go back to the offense for what we would say to wrap up the show, what we think needs to really work on positionally, you you hit linebackers on defense. Um, Something that obviously I think they also would work on is McLeod might not even be on the team next year, one, because his contract. So, and two, he's not getting any younger. So I think if whenever I, – I, I don't know if you do this in the first round, but uh, in the second or third, whenever there's a safe, a good safety falls to you, that's still a position you need to um, look to add to. you kind of just been having stop gaps fill in the safety position um, for Rodney McLeod, who was banged up, and uh, even the other safety position after Malcolm left. So – I think that's something you should focus on. And then uh, some of our cornerbacks play better than I – obviously, I expect Darius play to do with Darius. But, but like, other people play better than I expected them to to, to play in certain degrees. But at the same time, like, the Eagles are still – when you look at, like, draft coverage and stuff, rumored to get a corner if a guy falls to them, you you, you still need to add to that secondary. You you, you want to have another dynamic person and not just Darius Slay who's also not getting any – uh, younger, so um, I would say those are some things minus linebacker, which is a very standout one. You see uh, that the Eagles uh, should should add to safety and corner. You want to continue to solidify the secondary, especially if Jonathan Gannon is still here because of how I described how he plays defense less blitz centric. You want to continue to then add to your pass protection and also your run blitzing options from your secondary at the same time. So when you do mix it in, you want to have that option. You want to have the options of players that are as good run stopping as they are pass stopping with kind of the way that uh jonathan gannon runs his stuff no yeah, without question um i think i would lean toward um i think you fix it on the first round or not fix it but help it out i, I pull off on corner because i think like you said you have slay i think nelson started playing better at the year and maddox came along nicely so i'd go um linebacker edge rusher to, to get your guy from Brandon Graham here shortly and a uh, safety with your first three picks is what I would do. And I think you can really bounce off that and go forward, kind of like the Cowboys did with Parsons and uh, uh, why am I blank on that cornerback's name? Diggs? Was it Diggs? Yeah, Diggs. Yeah. yeah. Like you saw them rebuild the defense quickly. And you can do that this year in the first round. Um, you can get your star linebacker, then you can get your star edge rusher and corner. So that, that's the way I'd, I'd approach those first three picks. No, I agree. I think you could. But in the second round, I've been reading a lot up on the draft where it seems like where we're picking, we could get a receiver um, to fall because of the way the first round, at least in most people's eyes, is projected to go where you probably have at least one good receiver fall yeah, by he, that point in the second round. So, so if you want to add to that, you could get that in the second round. And then, like you said, focus on the linebackers, the the um, corners, and then getting the the edge rusher in the first round. Yeah, but to me, you already have your, your receivers. You already drafted young guys the last three years. I'd go after 
a, a veteran in that sense, like a Mike Williams, and then hold off on a receiver in the first two rounds and really build those other positions. Because you're going to need – on offense, you need a center to replace Jason Kelsey. So, again, I'd kind of sign Mike Williams, then you roll with Williams, Smith, and um, – And then just uh, draft the receiver next year. Watkins. Yeah. So I, I think that's the way I'd approach that and not worry about drafting a receiver. Because – to me, you can only have so many young guys. Or at some point, have another a veteran too. And hope he develops that you get in the later rounds. Because obviously, yeah. at that point, then it doesn't matter if you take a flyer on somebody later on. So you team, you signed two big time veterans and Torrey Smith and Alshon Jeffrey to help help that young course. That's what I want to see you do here. Just go get Mike Williams, who is similar to a Jeffrey. Yeah, no, I agree. I think they should look in the fringe, whether it's Mike Williams or others in there for a receiver to help out. This young core, um, I'm a little bit more on the train of, I would say, in the first three rounds. Like, I, I, I'm not as much as you as I want to pick a receiver because somebody's good there. I think it is good to have a good young mix with a couple people. Like, obviously, the Bengals, for example, they have Higgins and they also have uh, Chase. So, I think it's good. We had Macklin at one time. We also had Jackson. So, I think it's good to have a couple mix of younger guys at the same time while having a veteran come in. Because I don't, I, I love Quez Watkins, but Quez Watkins is a feature wide receiver. Like, like, like that's the, there's things of feature backs that you put in on certain plays. Quez Watkins is a wide receiver you put in on certain plays. And I praise this dude as he got in because of the pick he was at to what he was able to do and then develop into a good deep threat and a good, if you give it to him, probably in the backfield he could be because of his speed, usually utilized like that as well on those like end around plays. But he, I don't think he's going to turn into all of a sudden, uh, Two, so like like if you bring in Williams, that helps as a veteran. Watkins can stay as the four, mix in um, flex like feature receiver, and then you would have another young guy that's more of the T Higgins or the Brandon Ayuk of of your team type guy that that is developing, but but actually shows promise and is not like. I almost said Diggs for some reason because we had Diggs on our mind, but it's not it's not like uh, J. Joel or Sega Whiteside. I wish we had Diggs on our team as a receiver. Uh, it's not like J. Joel or um, Jalen Reger who were just suspect, to say the least. So, like, I feel like that that's why I'm a little bit more on getting a receiver. And also, one of those guys won't be on our team next year. Which one, I don't know. Both might not be on our team next year, but one of those guys definitely is not going to be on the team next year between Jalen Reger and... J.J. or second white side, if you add Williams and end up drafting receiver and have Chris Watkins, then you're already four deep. There's no way one of those guys is not making – or there's no way both of those guys are making the team, I should say, and if that's the case. But that's my point. So I draft another young guy after you failed time after time. That's why I look to, to sign someone who's Well, you themselves. fail time after time because of stupidity. Like, everybody knew when you – those same guys are – the same guys are still there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, you drafted Devontae Smith. That's the thing. So, if you can just well, go with Well, that was gifted the, to you. That was – exactly. But that's the thing. So was Justin Jefferson. You didn't take it. So, like, you had things – So, you're proving my point. That, well, I get that. But my point is we picked Smith, who was gifted to us. If you can just keep it simple and not overcomplicate things, then, the, then you could get it there. Because the Eagles – the Eagles could, at the same point, that point could be used for anything. Like, we haven't drafted the best consistently on line. We haven't be- drafted the best consistently early in the draft on um, edge rushing or whatever either. So, like, if the Eagles make the wrong decision there and pick a guy based off a potential rather than, say, the Georgia guy or or anything like that, uh, like, like, I wouldn't put that past them either. Like, I'm trying to be more positive when I agree with you with the three picks to go more defense in the first round. But they can make as much of a mistake there as they can as a receiver. I don't think it's exclusive to just the receiver position when it comes to We picked a firefighter in the first round. Really thank yeah. Danny Watt for his service and everything he did, but he did not deserve as an NFL football player to be picked in the first round. So, like, this team has a history of just doing – Dumb things in the first round. <laughs> so. Yeah. No, I hear you. Um, like, for example, or, or, in the, or um, 
I mean, I think it's just Howie has to stick with the scouts. You have to go with what the you have to go with the Devontae. That, that's why Burton Vine is here. You have to do the Devontae Smith pick. When somebody's there, there's somebody you just know is going to be a dude and be a dude that gets it done. Maybe there's somebody there that you're like, well, this dude might have more spark potential or whatever you want to call it. But you have to have guys come in that get it done from day one, like Devontae Smith did to help you next year. If you bring in the Mike Williams or you bring in another receiver, that helps you. Like if, say, Lockett or somebody gets traded, whoever it is, uh, you need to have another, I think, good young player to develop as well, like to Macklin, to the Jackson or whatever. Because most teams have a secondary. They don't just go one young guy veteran. So like, like that, I would rather have the, the, the developing actual secondary receiver, not just a feature receiver that I love in Quez Watkins, but he's more of a, of a feature receiver. That's why... Um, when everybody makes the shade like about different things the Eagles drafted, obviously it would look a lot better if we had J- JJ and uh, and um, what's his name and uh, Devonte Smith. But even if you had a guy like Ayuk or when he's healthy, should know like those guys have showed where where we should know it's different because the Jaguars are a dumpster fire. But like those guys as a whole, their talent wise have shown some skill where we have guys in. Regger, who have shown practically nothing, and J. Joel, who has started to do a little bit on special teams, but beyond that, has shown nothing. So, like, I feel like if you can just simplify the pick and say one of the top five receivers to fall into the six receivers fall into the second round, you just have to say, well, this guy fell because everybody went more defense, everybody went more linebacker, which a lot of mocks do have guys fall into the second round when it comes to receiver. Just sim- just keep it simple. Don't go, well, let's pick the equivalent to our Sega White side who we think has the extra talent if he can put it all together. No, just pick a dude that does have it all together that you think is, you know what I mean, that's going to be a productive guy, more likely from day one. Like a, like even an Ayuk of the world that people knew had to adjust to NFL playbooks and stuff, but then by like week three, week four, you saw him making an impact. You need to pick somebody even like that, whether it's week one or week four. Like, you need to see them in the first year, I think, start making an impact. No, without question. I mean, that's what you need to see out of all, all your young guys, especially the high drafted ones. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that's why I think the Eagles oversimpl- or overcomplicate things, excuse me, and never oversimplify things, which I think is something they should think about doing just because of how bad their draft history is, where I think with Devontae Smith, they literally would just, like you said, it was gifted to them, so they had no choice but to oversimplify and go, well, we're picking Devontae Smith. Where they need to do that with more picks because there's been multiple times where you and Rob talked about it where there's been an obvious guy on the draft board for the Eagles. And they go, okay, we're going to pick this dude. And you're like, uh, excuse me? So, like, they need to just think about it with clear lenses and stop thinking about it with, like, like they're Billy Bean or something of football because no nobody that works for the Eagles is a Billy Bean of football. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> no, we've not found that guy yet. No, that's for Dol- And the one guy that might have been able to help with that type of stuff left because he didn't like the culture of the team, the dude that worked for the Ravens. Remember that? I can't remember his name right now, but remember the guy that worked for the Ravens worked here for a bit and then he ended up leaving? For a different oh, job. It? Yeah. So they went to the Jets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's with the Jets now, but like the rumors were too. He didn't really like the way that things were like run and constructed here at the same time as yep. as um him wanting to obviously just take a better job for himself. So which that that doesn't surprise me at all. That's not the first person that that's been put in rumors about not liking the structure of the way the Eagles are um designed. But no, you laid it out. When it comes to defense, uh, the one thing that I see, but in the first round, I would say linebacker, edge rusher, and corner is more what you're going to get because safety, there's not as much to pick from, so you would have to have the exact safety fall to you um, at a pick and not somebody that's just like, a, again, like a skilled athletic. Hopefully they can pull it all together safety. You would have to have somebody that's more of a put it. It's just supposed to answer by day one, week one type. Uh, guy, and I don't know if that'll fall to you at, or be a better thing to pick in the first round. Usually, sometimes safeties go second, third, but, but, but we'll have to 
we'll have to see. I agree with you with the positions when it comes to uh, defense. The one other thing, though, just because Cox, obviously, um, you're adding an edge rusher. It'll be interesting to see the whole Fletcher Cox future because if he, um, if we end up adding by the draft, if he doesn't get moved by the draft, but then we say two edge rushers, or you get the Georgia guy that like is kind of the Parsons guy, like you told me, that can kind of come to the line and also be a linebacker and an edge rusher. Yeah, that'll make people, I think, start thinking more about what we're doing with Cox. Because if you get two people that are essentially edge rushers or are, then that's going to get definitely get people going. Well, does that mean they actually are going to trade Fletcher? You know what I mean? So I think what they do and what the not what the Flyers, what the Eagles point to going forward and what they're rumored to do will show where we are with people like that, too. Because if we're rumored to get two defensive gauntlet rushers in the draft, then that usually, that probably spells that Fletcher Cox's time is uh, towards the end. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I hear. But it's also, two in a way, two different positions because Fletcher's more on the inside than the outside as an edge rusher. That's more like Brandon Graham. That's a good point. That's a fair point. So you would have to get more of an inside yeah. tackle. Um for, for it to be, but at the, at the same time, again, Fletcher Cox fits to, he has a lot of trade value, having a good athletic running back, like I said, with Sanders, that still has upside, has trade value. If the Eagles think they can fill the holes via the um, draft or free agency with the assets they have and the money they have, obviously you're going to be able to fill holes if you trade Fletcher Cox, excuse me, and do it right. Uh, but that that's the same thing that we talked about with other stuff in this podcast. You have to hit on it. You can't mess up when you trade them. You have to hit it on the head and get the assets, whether it's getting linebackers or whether it's adding a linebacker. And since he's a big name person, a linebacker and a receiver, say, in the same trade or whatever, um, like you have to hit on the trade. That's the bottom. That's the bottom line. If you trade somebody like that, you, you, you can't pull what we've seen different teams in this town do for years and also even the Eagles when it comes to a couple of trades over time. So like with Sean McCoy, for example, but that was Chip Kelly's fault. Yeah. yeah, that's for sure. Uh, but no, I think uh, we basically at Pirlo, the great Pirlo wisdom from um, Steel Fighters said that's pretty much been our full 42. We gave you our defense for offense. I guess, uh, we can give a quickly what we would think are three on offense. If we had to add offense would be mine would be with the line aging. You obviously have to add to the offensive line, uh, whether that's via getting people in free agency you like or via the draft. Um, you have to add to, you don't need to add to the running back court. Uh, you, you should add to the receiving court. Like we talked about whether that's via a uh, free agency or the draft. And then when it comes to, unless if you trade Miles Sanders, then you would have, then you might want to add to the running back core. When it comes to that, I think, I think that's pretty much it with the offense. You would just want to add to the receiving core and um, add to the line. And I don't really have a third thing because with running backs, I think we already have a pretty solid group. Unless if we trade Sanders, then you might look to add somebody else. Yeah. No, I, I, again, I, I, I agree. I think from the running back standpoint, though, I'd, I just run it back, but no, nah, I yeah, there's, I, I agree with your points as well. Yeah, so you would say with um, the, I mean that's all the offense is kind of obvious where when you the, the more interesting thing is to hear on these podcasts, I think from us on what positions we would get is usually defense because you know, normally when people just watch a football team, you can pick out watching the team for three weeks usually what their offensive weakness is. Where, de- where, where defense, usually it'll take you a few more games probably to watch that team than just a three-game stretch to be able to really point out what their um, de- defensive weakness is. So it's always more interesting, I think, to talk about what teams need on defense from that aspect than it is offense, because offense is just so easy to figure out. You know what I mean? To an extent, I wouldn't say it's easy to figure out. I mean, it- um, maybe we, it's easy to see where. Well, it's not are, easy. But it's I'm saying it's easy to figure out from an analysis. Like, if you were analyzing something, like if you notice, even on like on TV, when people talk about offenses, they tend to rattle on more than except if you're like a defensive wizard and you're somebody 
like Ryan Clark that really invests in talking about defense, obviously, because he's a defensive player or something like that. That's different. But like most people tend to go on the rants about people's offenses more than they tend to do it with defense because most people just tend to get the bare bones on a team's defense and then just not really have the extra information with an offense. You'd always hear like, well, this dude played with such and such at Yale and uh, he might all have a connection with the back of quarterback since he did. Like you always hear more of that stuff where with like defenses, you never hear any of the extra talk because nobody really pays attention to a defense to the extent of how they pay attention to the offense. It's all about what's more exciting. It's all like everybody wants to talk about the exciting aspect where it's like the equivalency with baseball. What's more exciting, talking about pitching or talking about home runs? What's more exciting, talking about defense or talking about uh, offense in, in football when you have like a Chiefs level potential offense? So that, that, that's, um, that, that's a um, other side to it, but I think also just from an analysis standpoint, it's usually easier to look at an offense and say, like, this is their strength, this is their. Weakness. Like for the Patriots, you would say slants and quick passes are their strength, their weaknesses. If they have to depend so heartedly on having to space it to the outside and down the field, they probably ain't going to be that tough. And so, like, 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 there's um, the, the, like the, the, that would be that would be a that would be a um one example. But that, that that's all. That's all I was saying, though. But to wrap up, though, since we've been going a little bit long, um, winded on this one, and the football game is on now that we uh, both want to watch as well, as we wish you all um, great, ha- a great weekend and also enjoy the football games between the Rams and Bucks. That's going to be a great game that's on now. And the Buffalo Bills and Kansas City Chiefs, that obviously the Bills lost in the playoffs to the Chiefs last season, so will the Bills be able to get their revenge? But, Andrew, this will be out before that. So, actually, before I say where your um, tags are and everything and uh, give any final thoughts you have, but on top of that, since this will be out before 630, what's your prediction for that uh, Bills and Chiefs game? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to pick the Buccaneers to win. Um, I'd say 30 to 23. And then I will take the uh, – you know, Bills, 24-21. So you do have the Bills getting revenge, okay? Yes. Um, for me, the Bucks game, with the way I just see Odell and Stafford connecting, and it's not even necessarily from a chemistry connection, it's more just from the, like, I just know how talented this dude is, Eli Manning, Style thinking of if he's on a corner of an end zone, I'm just throwing this thing up to this man. And he, but like Stafford just knows how to pinpoint those those balls as well as it is chemistry stuff. But I think that game could be really close. With this one, I'll be the devil's advocate. I'll go 23-21 Rams. Uh, because I think that connection has really helped the Rams, and I think that if the Rams win the Super Bowl or get to it, a big extra X factor that got them there would actually end up being, which I don't think anybody thought was going to be said at the beginning of the season, Odell Beckham. So um, that'll be that'll be something to follow. With the Bills, I do agree, though. With the Bills, the way the Bills have been playing uh, this year, uh, I'll go... 27 to 17 uh, Bills, because I also like how the Bills defense has been playing, and the Chiefs offense has obviously been fine this year, but we've seen more games this year than any other year since Mahomes took over that they have been able to be not necessarily stopped, but at least lessened this year, and with the way the Bills defense has been able to play, that's why also on top of the way Josh Allen and the offense has played, I I would go with the Bills. But we thank everybody for joining this edition of the Sports Fanatic News NFL Football Show. You can find me at JJBoard26. You can find Andrew at AJ underscore Santangelo on Twitter. This has been the Eagles podcast where we talked about what we think the Eagles need to do heading into this offseason and where we're at heading into this offseason after a nice surprise playoff game that we got to have this year to give our young guys experience, which is actually something we didn't even talk about in the podcast, but is a, but is a, but is a great thing. Uh, to have moving forward to just get the experience in itself. 
Stay safe out there, everybody. Enjoy the NFL games. And as always, um, please come back and continue to like and subscribe down below or up above on the easy-to-use widget at the end of the video. Peace out, everyone.